Hey everyone, um, this is the first of three short videos that I'm making for Thursday's lectures. And each of these videos are going to cover a core uh, aspect of NLP that will form an important foundation for next week when we'll introduce the transformer and transformer language models. Uh, most state-of-the-art NLP models now use the transformer uh, but this lecture is going to provide some basic background um, that you're going to need to know um, to either kind of understand what's going on in the transformer model and where that came from, um, or that you might need to understand to consume NLP literature, as sometimes you still see these older models and methods used. Um, and so there's going to be this video, which is about language modeling and recurrent neural networks. Um, there's going to be a video about models of words. Um, and then finally, uh, there, there'll be a video introducing sequence to sequence models. All right, um, so I'm going to delve right into language modeling. Um, and so, yeah, as I said, um, even though, you know, if you're doing an NLP task today, you might want to use a modern transformer-based model. It's still important to understand the foundation um, that's in this lecture. And so language modeling answers the question, is this sentence probable? If we had a sentence, um, the student went to school, that should be a probable sentence where a student to the school went um, should have low probability. So what will we use this for? I mean, you could use it to have a grammar check or for autocomplete, um, but most often for us, it's a means to some other end. And so in particular, when we have these deep neural language models, they're gonna uh, provide us with representations of text. And those representations of text can be used for other NLP tasks that we wanna perform. Now, obviously, language modeling has a lot of commercial value um, and that Largely that commercial value, I'd say, has you know, been an important driver of um, absolutely mind-blowing language models um, that we can use to do um, a variety of downstream tasks. All right, um, and so kind of as in all things that we'll see in this course, um, initially people tried to uh, do computational processing of language using human engineered approaches, in other words, using rules. Um, and obviously, if you want to have human engineered approaches of how language works, you have to encode just a massive amount of information about grammar and morphology and context, as well as the many exceptions and the exceptions to the exceptions. Um, and so we need to have a grammar of the language um, we need to consider uh, the morphology and exceptions that come up. There needs to be semantic categories. And then we have to have exceptions. You know, the store went to Jane, typically, you know, would not be a probable sentence, but the food truck went to Jane could be. And then suppose we do all of that for English and we want to apply it to Japanese. Well, we're going to have to start over. All right. So let's think about how people traditionally um, thought of language modeling. Um, and so, you know, in the age before neural networks, um, NLP uh, was largely the domain of linguists. Um, if you look at it today, it's kind of largely the domain of, of, of deep learning and has really converged with other areas of deep learning, but it used to take a lot of really specialized knowledge. Um, and um, so linguists traditionally use count-based approaches to model language. Um, and so the idea is that you predict the next words using the frequencies of word sequences. Um, and so you could take the frequency of the teacher read and divide that by the frequency of the teacher. Um, and so we can calculate the log likelihood of all sentences in the corpus um, and suppose we want to test how well we're doing, we take a corpus of test data, that is data not seen when these counts were computed on the training data, and we use the model to compute the probability of each sentence and sum up overall sentences in the corpus. And if the model is extensible, we should have a higher log likelihood. Um, we can also normalize by the number of words in the corpus. 
Okay, so a common kind of count-based approach um, is engrams. So an engram is a sequence of inconsecutive words. So a unigram is just one word, like this class covers NLP. You could have bigrams, this class, class covers, covers NLP, and so on, trigrams, fourgrams. Um, and counts of different engrams uh, can be used to predict the next word. Um, so what's the problem uh, with this approach? Well, it treats all words as IID. It can't account for things like synonyms. Um, another kind of major problem is that it can't handle long run dependencies. So uh, for ballet lessons, she needed to bring her new shoes um, versus for tennis lessons, she needed to bring her new ball. Um, long range dependencies are very, very common in human language and not being able to account for them is, is a problem. Um, so why can't this model account for long range dependencies? Um, so take the example this class will cover um, and then mask and we want to predict what uh, mask is, which should be NLP. Uh, but what if this class covers NLP never occurred in the training data? Um, even worse, what if this class covers never appeared? You can't divide by zero, um, and so then you're really going to have a problem. You could handle this by a technique called back off, where instead you look for class covers and, um, and you divide by that. Uh, but this sparsity problem becomes more and more severe as n increases. And so in practice, you cannot have n in your n-gram bigger than 5, uh, because then you have too much of a sparsity problem. Um, and moreover, the size of the model is going to grow exponentially in N, uh, which is also a problem. And so in practice, to be implementable and not to have a sparsity problem, you have to have N be pretty small. Uh, but then once N is small, you can't cover long range dependencies. Um, and so this is an example I found from a Stanford linguistics course um, that gives example of text generated by a three by a, a model of three grams. And as you can tell, it's just completely incoherent. Um, for human language to make sense, you really need to have long run dependencies. Otherwise, you're not going to be able to generate coherent text. Uh, but you can't do that with engrams because increasing M will worsen sparsity and exponentially increase your model size. And so the deep learning alternative, you calculate features from the context, you learn the weights used to calculate the features with deep learning, and then you can compute probabilities from those features. This is just an example um, of text generated with a, um, a neural language model. I think this is actually GPT-2, um, which by this point has been left behind by GPT-3 and GPT-chat, but it's still it's pretty good. Um, it's definitely coherent, um, unlike the ingram generated text. All right. So, Differences on other tasks that we would like to do, like classification or retrieval, are also striking. Um, we'll see an example later in this course on deduplication of noisy text. Even that, it seems like that should be a pretty straightforward problem, um, but even there, deep learning you know significantly outperforms engrams. Um, so if you want to use text data in your research, you absolutely need to understand um, modern deep learning methods. Um, Yet, um, before we get there, I want to talk a little bit more about something that you'll see sometimes still used a lot um, and why we might think that that might be uh, problematic, uh, which is bag of words. Okay, so what does bag of words do? It takes all words in a sentence and makes predictions regardless of the syntax. Um, so for example, if you were doing sentiment analysis with bag of words, um, you may have a score for the probability each word in a sentence is associated with each sentiment to be classified, and bag of words adds up those probabilities. Okay, so I hate this movie. It's looking up each of those words. There might be a bias term, and then it creates scores um, and uh, uses those to compute probabilities um, of, the, of the sentiment of the sentence. Um, so, you know, what's going to be the problem with this? Suppose we think of, you know, I hate this class. I don't love this class. I don't hate this class. There's nothing I don't love about this class. Um, you can't capture that um, in those differences with bag of words. You need combinations of, of features um, to, to capture that. And so instead of being up here where we just look up each word and then add up, 
we need some complicated function to extract combinations of features and then we can use that to compute scores and probabilities. Um, so how do we approximate a complicated function? Well, like if you learn only one thing from this class, you know, please, please let it be um, that deep neural networks um, are the way that you would approximate a very complicated function. And so obviously this is going to be a task um, uh, that neural networks are going to be helpful for. Okay. Um, so with that said, um, now I want to move on to talking about uh, recurrent neural networks. All right. Um, and um, so last class, uh, when we talked about convolutional neural networks, um, that was a one-to-one -one architecture. It consisted of an input vector, a hidden layer, and a fixed size output vector. Um, whereas what RNNs do is to let us operate over sequences, either as an input or as an output, um, or both. Um, and so in a task like image captioning, where we give it an image um, and we want it to provide a caption for us, or OCR, where we give it an image um, and um, we want it to provide the text string that's associated with that, that's a one-to-many task. So the input is an image, and the output is a variable length sequence of words. Um, Envision, the mini input case, um, could come from video, for example. Um, in NLP, sentiment analysis is a mini to one task. So you have a sequence, an arbitrary length sequence of, of words that you input, and you, your output is a sentiment. Um, machine translation is a mini to many task where you have arbitrarily length sequences as both the inputs and the outputs. Okay, so a recurrent neural network is fed an input vector at every time step and also maintains an internal state. And it can modify that state as a function of what it receives at each time step. So here H is the state or history and um, XT is the input vector at each time step. Um, and f is a recurrence function uh, that has weights w as its parameters. Um, and the reason why we can have sequences of arbitrary lengths is that the same function with this is applied at every time step. So we use the same weights at every t, um, regardless of what the sequence length is. Um, and based on this, we produce an output um, yt. Okay, so this is what just a plain vanilla recurrent neural network would look like. Um, so you have weights and you add up your history with your input and then you squish it. Um, you apply that nonlinearity, which we've seen before in this course, um, to get your next history. And then to get your output um, from that history, you just multiply it by another set of weights. Um, so this is a toy example um, from uh, Andre Karpathy, who I think is really like um, the master of toy examples. I, I highly recommend them. I think um, in the intro lecture last week, I recommended a video he had about back prop, but it's really, he's great. Um, so suppose we estimate a character level language model for a four letter, letter language, it consists of H, E, L, and O, and we want to predict a distribution at each step for what letter should come next. Um, so we can start with one hot encodings. And then, you know, at each step we apply this function. Okay, and that's sort of, that's the basic idea. So at each step you have the input layer, a hidden layer, there's your output layer. You take the softmax over that to compute kind of the, the uh, most likely output. And then you can use that as the input um, to your next step. And again, you have a hidden layer um, and an output layer and take the softmax um, and so on. All right. Um, and so um, he um, also applies a model that's sort of analogous to this, to an actual corpus. Um, so um, let me just, um, you know, in the interest of time, um, show you some of the output, which is kind of, um, which is kind of fun, you know, and so he initializes it and it's giving you total garbage. Um, whereas when it's trained more and more, you know, it's not exactly 
coherent text, <laughs> but it's at least it's producing words. Um, this is what it looks like trained on Shakespeare's work, um, trained on algebraic topology. Again, this is an actually coherent math, but it manages to kind of reproduce um, <laughs> you know, the, the general style. Um, of course, you can do, do, do way better. Um, with a modern language model. Like again, I'm showing GPT-2 again here. All right, um, so that's a basic idea of a recurrent neural network. So just remember like with the CNNs we saw, if it, um, you know, we had a one-to-one -one where we had this fixed size output. Um, and with a recurrent neural network, now we can take arbitrarily sized inputs and potentially have arbitrarily sized outputs. All right. Um, so the RNN formulation that I just uh, showed you earlier, um, so let me again go back and just recap this, um, you know, where essentially we have a history for period T minus one, and that has a set of weights, and we're adding it to the weighted um, value of our input and taking a nonlinearity to get next period's history, um, and then weighting that to get the output. So this, this formulation would never actually be used in practice. Um, why is that? Um, well, this is, again is going to be a theme throughout the course. If you want to optimize a deep neural network, um, since you're just doing backprop um, through the network um, to update the parameters, you need to worry a lot about how gradients are flowing um, through the network. And to backprop, we chain the local gradient with the upstream gradient. Um, well, that's going to be a problem with an RNN, and this is an idea that goes, you know, all the way back um, to the early um, 1990s. Um, and so what allows us to model arbitrary sequence lengths um, with an RNN is using the same weight matrix at every step. Um, but that's going to be a problem for these long-run dependencies. And remember that long-run dependencies are essential um, to human language. Um, and so when we backprop to the earlier layers, the chain rule will entail matrix multiplication by W over and over again, since the network structure multiplies by W at every time step in the forward pass. Um, and so if the largest singular value of W is greater than one, the gradient is going to explode. And if it's less than one, the gradient's going to vanish. Um, we can avoid exploding gradients by clipping them but um, vanishing gradients will prevent us from training the network um, and necessitate using a different architecture. Um, and so what was used in practice um, is something called LSTM. Um, I'm not going to be able to <laughs> talk at any um, amount of detail about uh, what is entailed in LSTM. Um, if you want to learn more, I think that there are references um, on the syllabus um, because I need to get to two more videos that I also want you to watch for Thursday. Um, but the basic idea between uh, the basic idea of an LSTM is that you have these uh, different gates. Um, and so you can kind of think of this as being zero one, even though really we squish them into sigmoids um, because we need differentiability. Um, and so you update the cell state um, by deciding whether to remember, which is this forget gate called F, and deciding whether and how much um, I, the input gate, and G to write to a cell. And you only allow part of the cell value to enter the history, uh, which determines the output in a learnable way O. Um, and so again, I know that I haven't really <laughs> explained in any detail how an LSTM works, um, but the basic idea um, is that this gives you a path for uninterrupted gradient flow because of the add gate. Um, assuming you don't forget everything and you avoid forgetting everything by initializing the forget gate near one, right? And so because you have this um, add gate that you see, um, that, that you see there, um, that gives you uninterrupted gradient flow. Um, and where have we seen this before? Um, the answer is in ResNet. So the skip connections in ResNet effectively act as add gates, um, allowing for unimpeded gradient flow. Um, and so I know I haven't explained this in any amount of detail, but if you are interested in going back and understanding how LSTM works, um, 
you know, think about that and the parallels with ResNet, which really came and revolutionized vision many, many years later. There's also a 2000 a uh, 15 paper, paper called Highway Networks um, that has sort of a similar idea in it as well um, about allowing uninterrupted gradient flow. All right, I'll make just an additional notes. I think I put a paper on the reading list called LSTM, a search-based odyssey. The documents in detail that results are fairly robust to changing the details around of the LSTM architecture, you probably wondered why it took exactly you know, this particular form and they look at robustness to that. Um, today, um, it's, it's much, much less common um, to see LSTMs used for NLP. They're just really uh, outperformed uh, by the transformer architecture, um, which operates over inputs in a sequence in parallel through an intention mechanism. We'll understand what that means um, when we get to next week rather than processing the input sequentially. Um, so you probably wouldn't use an LSTM um, in your research, but you'll still see it sometimes. So it's good to understand what it is. Um, and that is it for language modeling. Um, remember to watch uh, the movie, sorry, the, the videos about um, words. Uh, and uh, also about sequence to sequence as well. Thank you.